You guys remember uh, how and why God called Israel his people? You guys remember back in the story um, how he did that, how it started, and then why he did that? A little history lesson, anybody? It started with Abraham, called him, made a covenant with him. You're right. And yeah, yeah. And why? To bless all the nations of the world through Abraham and his descendants. That's right. And later on in the story, we we are reminded through uh, the Israelites being in captivity. Uh, they were in captivity, and Moses was raised up to be used by God to set God's people free. And then there was a wandering in the desert, if you will, and uh, as they're on this journey to the promised land. And if you remember, they were given rules or guidelines on how to live a life close to God in, in a way that uh, is under his protection. And, and they did that. But after a little bit, they said this is like a new kind of slavery. You guys remember that? This is like, what, what is this? We can't do this. We can't do this. But the purpose of God giving them guidelines and, and, and setting a, a way to live was why. Why did he do that? To protect them. Yeah. And for them to have like this standout kind of relationship and closeness with him. And it was to demonstrate to the whole world of his existence, of his life, of his love. And so the Israelites, if we want to fast forward, if the Israelites, they were given festivals and feasts and and uh, tons of rituals to do to be reminded of God and his love for them and the world around them. And uh, what took place over centuries was a people group who did what they were supposed to do because God said so, and it became just ritualistic. It was just, you know, it's like throwing a party but not inviting God when the parties about God and we and, and it's a people group that forgot about God and actually today you you may be shocked to hear this today among the Jewish culture who are part of synagogues and and uh, connect in that way a great portion of them are atheist believe that or not I remember sitting down with Rabbi George and he told me most is his congregation up on the hill over there is atheistic, he said. I'm like, what in the world? And I would say, you know, since that part of the story, we see that Jesus came to rescue. He was sent by God, being God himself. He came to rescue people. And redeem them. So not, not just the Israelites, but introduce to Gentiles, people who are not Jewish, about this way of life, a life living close to God, learning about his love for them, and developing all kinds of reminders as well, as we call this group of people the church, right? Whether you're Jewish or not, you're part of the church, a people group who are set apart, but yet called into the rest of the world to show and share God's grace and love with other people. And the church as well has become ritualistic in a lot of what she does. She, for the most part, has forgotten why. We are, our mindsets have changed. The way we live has changed. With the way we look at life has changed. You ever wonder why or how a... <clears throat> a uh, Christian family can raise Christian kids and the kids are older and they want nothing to do with God. Do you ever wonder how that happens? Like how in the world does that work? Why is it that way? Isn't there a Bible verse that talks about 
it, they'll, they'll come back to the way if you if you raise them right they'll come back isn't there just, help me out with this what's the verse how's that go train up a child in the way they ought to go and when they're older they won't depart from that right what happened to that like why what right so we're we're actually starting today a series that talks about rhythms and life and how we want to redeem all aspects of life because unfortunately the church has compartmentalized their faith and some parts are about God and and some parts are not I recently here's the our nifty slide that was put together uh, rhythms can you guys see that I hope you can see that rhythm right walking this out walking out our faith in the everyday life of stuff okay I recently had a conversation with an individual who was a pastor and uh, so I'm talking about a pastor. Do you guys know what a pastor does for a living? What does that mean? This is for people online as well who may not have an understanding of what a pastor, I'm not saying pasture, which is different, like a bunch of grass where animals go and eat. I'm talking about a pastor. Okay. Okay. So a pastor shepherds people, right? Okay. Did you say sheeple? <laughs> That's good. Okay. So this, this pastor and I, we were having a conversation, and we were talking about um, the different arenas of life. And this person was actually a volunteer coach as well of a sport. And he mentioned how he, you know, you're not, you're not supposed to talk about God while you're coaching because you're, that's not what you've been asked to do. You've been asked to coach, and I, I, I keep this arena for talking about, because I'm hired as a pastor to talk about God here, but over here I've been asked to coach, so I need to just honor that. You know, you guys do anything like that? Like, I work as a teacher, or I work as this or that. I need to honor my boss and keep my lines, like, right. You know, we, we, we might have that mentality, it was shocking to me because for me, I come from the perspective that all of life is worship. All of life is God's. All of life belongs to God, even when I'm volunteering or if I'm at the YMCA. And so it's a different mindset for us, but we're so used to as a people to compartmentalize the rhythms of our lives. That this is belongs to this and this. You know, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. And we, and we kind of do this, right? And we look through the lens of this is good, this is bad. This is Christian, this is not Christian. Uh, this is Christian fellowship, this is not Christian fellowship. This is Christian music, this is not Christian music. Uh, this, I, I can participate in this holiday because it's you know, Easter and Christmas and this is about God or, or even more extreme, you know, that's not because of what we've done as a culture, we've not. Uh, this is not about God. And we say Halloween and, and, and things like this are not about God. So I'm not going to participate in that. And we, we, we draw these lines and we compartmentalize these things when all of life belongs to God. All of it. What makes a Halloween party good or bad or Christian or non-Christian is not what the culture deems it to be. It's what the believers of Jesus bring to it. You understand that? You could go to a, like if I were to say, hey, if I start listing things, we, okay, let's, let's play this game for a second. Uh, poker, poker night. You know, where would we categorize that? You know, something that we should participate in or not, Right? We, we, could, we could draw these lines. We could say, you know what, you know, this or that. We can draw these lines, and typically we would say, no, I would not gamble. I would not drink. I would not do these things. But I guarantee you, if you have believers step into an environment with purpose, with a mindset of bringing Christ to bear in a specific experience or environment, 
that experience would be amazing, right? That would be fantastic to walk away with that. I guarantee you, people, if you were, if you were to go into an environment, sorry, I'm having a moment. If you were to go into an environment where it's not known to be a Christian experience, but a believer was to go into that environment and bring Christ to bear, to bring glory to Jesus in that environment, that would be beautiful. And I guarantee you, if we purposefully did that at a Halloween party or at a poker night, God would be honored and glorified in that. Believe it or not, you can experience a Sunday morning anywhere in the country. You have a Sunday experience, which is supposed to be Christian in a, in a church setting. And there are many congregations, and we're not exempt from doing that here, okay? Many congregations, you can leave here, and we spoke nothing of Jesus, we spoke nothing of God, and we actually gave an anti-gospel message on a Sunday morning where it's about works-based, what you do makes you good, and you need to do better, right? That's an anti-gospel message. That is not uncommon among congregations. And, and, and we give people not Jesus, right? So what I'm trying to encourage us to look at is every rhythm, whether it's a, a Sunday gathering, a prayer group, a Bible study, no matter what it is, we can easily walk away with a, a, a non-Jesus experience. And all the, the, the categories and paradigm where we've put over here is a not Christian thing could be redeemed for Christ if we go into those rhythms and experiences with a mindset of Jesus, right? And so... It's, it's if you think about the Jewish people, if you think about the church, the early church, God didn't say, I'm redeeming you, I'm rescuing you to, to create a Christian cul-de-sac and live on that cul-de-sac and only be plugged into the things that are deemed by you and the culture Christian. That's not what the scripture says. The scripture speaks opposite of that. I'm redeeming you restoring and rescuing your life so that you can bring and point to me, bringing glory to me in and through everything you do. There are people here in this room or watching online that you are a gifted teacher. Don't just think as a believer you should be a teacher at a Christian school. I would encourage you to be a teacher in a non-Christian school. There are people here who are gifted administrators Go and be a principal. Go and do what God has gifted you to do in the world. Like, don't, don't just close ourselves to a Christian cult of sect. There's so much more that God has for the bride. There's so much more that he has for us than just to sit around with each other. He wants us in the world to point to him in and through everything. And it starts around our dining room tables with our children and friends. When's the last time I had someone around my table? That's a message for next week. I'm sorry, I won't talk about that. That'll be next week. Okay. So today we're starting a series where we're going to talk about six rhythms that exist in every culture that God wants to redeem in our lives. He wants to redeem. If you've been around at any, at any length of time at all, if you go back to our, the archives of our messages, listening from June all the way to today, you're going to be hearing things about the, the, the purpose of the church, the mission of the church, how we ought to live, our new identity, how Jesus has redeemed us from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin in the future. You're going to have heard about the truths of God and his nature, the, the lies that we need to take captive of in our thoughts, and you, about gospel fluency, this idea of bringing Jesus to bear in and through every life circumstance 
to help set us free today to live the abundant life. You're going to have heard all these things and what it looks like to live on mission or an intentional life, right? It's like, I don't have time for all this, Art. There's not space in my life to do all of this today. Hopefully, over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about what it looks like to live a Christian life in the everyday. So here are the, the six rhythms that exist in every culture, okay? So the first rhythm is story formed, how we are all formed by a story and a storyline. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. The next rhythm is listen. The next rhythm is celebrate, bless, eat. That's the table comment for next week. And the last rhythm is recreate. I'll explain what we mean by all of those. Now, these rhythms, like I said, exist in every culture, which is a, a, a beautiful thing because we can live out Christ in and through all of these rhythms. And so if you're, you decide the Spirit's moving you to Africa, you can live in Africa and, and live this out because every culture across the globe experiences these rhythms. Now, uh, we're going we're gonna to hone in and talk about uh, two, the first two rhythms. Now, there's not an order, okay? Not like, there's not an order you need to memorize these, but it would be good to have these tucked away in the back of our heads eventually. I don't expect anybody to have all this memorized at all until we start living it out, and it's come, it comes to be natural, right? And so we're going to spend three weeks talking about all these rhythms. Today, we're going to focus on story, form, and listen. And next week, we'll be celebrate, bless, and eat. And the last week, we're going to talk about recreate and what that means. So today, as we talk about story form, I'm going to give a little bit of story form and listen and then get into some scripture for, with us. So uh, you guys uh, familiar with the game Hunger, the Hunger Game movie? Are you familiar with that? Familiar with the books, Hunger Games, right? So I was just introduced to that uh, recently in my life. It's a movie series, and I watched all the movies, and I almost wanted to watch them all together right away. There, it's it's so fun, okay. And uh, so there's a character in the movie. I don't want to ruin it if people haven't seen it. But there's a character in the movie uh, called Peter, Pe- Peter, Peta, Peta, Peta. All right. There, this individual was was taken. Right. This individual was in captivity. And he was brainwashed to think a certain way and and to live a certain way. And you see in the movie him be like basically changed. He wasn't who he was. It first started with his thoughts and then values and actions. We saw it just like that through changing the way he thought through this brainwashing experience. We saw his thoughts change, his values and then his actions. Watched a movie. Was it two nights ago? Yeah, two nights ago, we watched a movie called, not Spider-Woman, Black Widow. We saw a movie called Black Widow. It's a Marvel movie, if you've ever seen anything like that, right? It's a movie, comic book stuff. Well, this Black Widow is a, a, a woman, and we learned her backstory. And in this backstory, once again, you see a bunch of young girls trained to be assassins. And you watch this unfold very quickly in the beginning of the movie where it's what they're watching on a TV screen. It's people training them, people talking to them, giving them a message over and over and over until their thoughts, values, and actions are changed. Everybody is formed by story. We're all story-formed people. We're all products of our experiences and environments what we put in our minds, what we see with our eyes, we're all products of that. It's a, a, a culmination. It's adding all these things together. There's not one believer of, in Jesus or pre-believer in Jesus. There's not one human being that is not formed by the story and experiences of their childhood. Every single person in this room, we look through a lens that needs to be redeemed. We look through a lens where we are either, we grow up, either the pain, experiences we've had at childhood, 
horrible experiences of being jumped as a kid or horrible experiences where we've been, you know, hungry or we had divorce in our life or where there was pain or suffering or growing up in the ghetto or whatever it might be, poverty. We have these lenses we look through. I am like, this is like truth for me. I look through a lens of being rejected. That's a lens I commonly look through because I've been formed by a story in my life where I was rejected and not good enough. And there was story after story, and the people that helped form that story, it was all unintentional. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, a father or a mother or siblings saying, you know, I hope you grow up feeling rejected because you're truly not good enough. No one ever said that. That was never, like, bluntly shared. But it was through story, being formed by story, that that came out in my life. We can all look through. And if we don't know, if you're sitting here today or watching online and you do not have a clue of what that lens is for you, I want to encourage you to experience counseling and dig into your childhood and write down some hard moments you've gone through in your life to highlight what that story is. And if there's children in the room right now, you're being formed right now. You guys are not exempt from ex- being shaped by the story you're, you're being influenced by. And not all of this is just um, negative things. This could be the story of money. This could be the storyline of if I grew up in poverty or I didn't have, the solution to that is seeking wealth. That could be the storyline. Okay, uh, if I grew up in a normal house and it's like, you know what, success is the storyline uh, or or you know what, if experience ed- exotic experiences traveling might be the storyline. Every single human being is living this lesser story. I'm, I'm, I'm deeming it as a lesser story because at the heart of all of us is we're seeking peace. We're seeking satisfaction we're seeking happiness. We're seeking joy. We're seeking fulfillment. We're, se- we're seeking these things that we were created to experience because we talked about in the past, we were created as eternal beings. So we're seeking this eternal satisfaction and experience, but the world will always leave us hungering for more. All the time. And so that's the lesser story. And the truth is, as we talked about in the beginning of this message, there's a grand narrative from the very beginning where God has called the people to live a life close to him and introduce to the rest of the world him in this grand narrative. And until our eyes are opened, our neighbors, our kids, our friends, our family, there's people around our lives that don't realize they're living the lesser story. We need to be reminded by one another that we're living the lesser story in this. We're not exempt from falling into that lesser story lifestyle, looking for things to satisfy us, right? And so we, we constantly need to grow in knowing and understanding the grand narrative, God's plan, his, his redemptive plan through Christ. Right, right when we become believers, we don't go with him and, and you know, and, and we call it heaven, right? We're not taken away from this place right away because God has plans. He has purposes. He wants others to get to know him through his bride, through the body of Christ. And so in the first uh, rhythm, story form, so a piece of this is to grow in our knowledge, understanding of the story, the grand narrative of, of Jesus, of God, and what his plan is. And what are some ways we can grow in the story of learning God's story? Because if we don't know his story, if we don't know that, then how do we give people God and introduce them to, to him? So, so, so what's one way we can grow in learning the grand narrative? I didn't hear. Reading the scriptures, reading and knowing the scriptures, which is why I'm going to share a part of scripture, a lengthy part of scripture today in an, an area where we may not be reading, but I want to introduce us to more of the scriptures, the word, 
What's another way we can grow in the grand narrative? What are we doing through the gospel communities? So our gospel communities are coming together right now. And we're walking through what we call the story of God. Go ahead. Yeah, it should never grow old. If we're like, I already know that, we've lost the purpose of why we exist and how, what really knowing that is for. Right, that's good. Awesome. I mean, we could sit here and talk more about different ways we can grow in learning God's story and the grand narrative plan that God has in our lives, but I want to keep, keep moving right along here. Um, so a part of being story-formed is also learning the, the stories of the people in our lives, learning their stories. Can you learn their stories without asking them questions? No. Can you learn people's stories if they don't share? No. Is listening to people's stories important? It is. And listening, how, how, what does good listening sound like or look like? Do you guys know what does good listening look like? Robin, you might be like, I can't wait to talk. You know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, what does good listening sound like? Yeah, your posture, right? You have a posture. Y you make eye contact, right? Uh, and even asking questions from good questions of what they're sharing. Say, hey, can you tell me more about that? Yeah, Robin. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 That's good. So pauses, silence, be okay with that. That's good. I repeated that for people online. So I had an experience this week where I met somebody and uh, we're having a conversation and they asked me a question, a little bit about my story. He said, hey, tell me about this. And I was like, oh, sweet. So I authentically opened up. It's like, oh, they, they want to know. I can't wait to share about this because to be honest, you and I feel loved when we get to share our story and people care. They want to know. And so I'm sharing my story and I'm sharing an answer to their question and I'm pouring my heart out. And they had a, a watch that must have been one of those eye watches or something because when you look at the time, you don't need to stare at it <laughs> like that. There must have been reading of a text or something. So I'm sharing my answer, and this is what I'm looking into. And this is what I hear. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's cool. I didn't feel loved. I didn't feel heard. I didn't feel like they cared. How often is our attention towards something else when it comes to listening to people, right? And so part of being redeemed people of God is to truly care, one, know the grand narrative of what God is doing, and two, really care about the people in your life and their story, right? Remembering things, remembering their name, writing down things, and, and circling back saying, hey, you mentioned this a little bit ago. I just want to check in on that. Or uh, All these things are showing that God is loving them through you in this rhythm of being story formed, okay? So in this rhythm, we all have a story, and oftentimes it's a lesser story we're living in the grand scheme of things, and it would be really healthy for us to listen to people by asking questions to learn their story and where their story may be closer, might be interacting with the grand narrative, because the point is to help people see where they're at in the grand story and help them move along in that process. So that's, a, that's a little bit uh, of... Uh, story form. We could talk a lot more about that, and there's tons of verses connected in that. 
But I want to move on to uh, the next the, the next rhythm, um, which is uh, listen. Okay, so listen. Uh, Jesus demonstrated this perfectly, uh, this rhythm of listen. So beautiful how he lived this out. But the rhythm of listen that exists in every culture is every single human being is listening to a voice in their life. That, that inner voice they're listening to. And one thing I think of here is I have multiple younger brothers. I have three younger brothers. And I have the next kin. And then the next one is seven years younger than me. And then one 17 years younger than me. So most of my life, all the way till I was 17, he was born. And so he wasn't really in the picture, but he is today. And I wish he lived in my town because I would love to hang out with my brother, Will. Uh, all my brothers, really. But Will, you know, I felt like I didn't really get to know him growing up. So growing up, though, I had two brothers that were right next to me. And as I think about this rhythm of listen, I think of my two brothers. Because we're always listening to something or someone. And it shapes our thoughts subconsciously, right? And so I think of whether it's music or movies, we start to dress a certain way, we're influenced a certain way. It's all because we're listening to something, okay? Whether, whether you're at uh, a high school, at, you're seeing people around you, you know, w- whether it's a sport or whatever you're doing, you're being influenced. It's like, I need to dress a certain way to fit into this population. Or I'm listening to, I need to wear these clothes or drive this kind of car to fit into this population, right? This group of people. Um, so we're constantly listening to a voice and we don't realize that most of the time. I think of my two brothers, my brother Cody and my brother Chris. Chris is the next one younger than me. My brother Cody, if you guys know me, I love all my brothers, right? And uh, Chris and I liked different kinds of music. I was into like alternative kind of music and he was into rap and, uh, you know, R&B or whatever you call that. I was into like, uh, you know, this kind of clothes. He, he was really fashionable, like he came from Europe. Like my brother Chris was like sharp. He wore cologne like at, you know, fourth grade. Like he was, he was, the, he was the dude. Like he was cool. I was not cool. I didn't really care about what I wore, but he presented well in this environment, right? And, you know, he enjoyed a good, you know, a good party and lots of fun. And, and I didn't have cool friends like that. And so I wasn't invited to parties. I was like a party pooper, if you will. Um, a- a- everybody has a party pooper. And my brother Cody, as he was getting older, I was watching him literally choose my brother Chris. Like literally, he followed him. He mimicked him. He dressed like him. He hung out with him. And I'm like to myself thinking, why not me? Why not my music? Why not dress like me? But he was listening to a voice and he saw whether it was success or something. And this was when we were younger. You know, it's, today's, today's different, but... But growing up, I always was like, man, and I longed for him to want to be like me. And he never did, chose me. But I think of that growing up, and I'm talking about like young, five years old, to like 15, 17, right in there, where we listen to certain voices. And that's what the rhythm of listen is all about. What voice are we listening to? What voice in the believer's life are we listening to? Unfortunately, it's not always God's voice. Even for a person who calls himself a Christian, it's not always God's voice. But we want to redeem this rhythm, just like we redeem story formed, right? And so redeeming this rhythm would be exactly what you see on the screen, listening to God forward and backwards. And we see Jesus listening to God forward and backwards perfectly here we have a scripture in mark 1 35 to 37 before daybreak the next morning jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray to pray jesus constantly withdrew from people and connected to god to listen to god constantly did that 
And so when we listen to God backwards, it's actually being in the word of God, the, the, the scriptures. So what has God done? What is he doing? Who is God in this experience? And learning about the pattern of God and how consistent he is. Well, listening to God forward is listening to the Holy Spirit today. In our prayer time this morning before gathering, one of the prayers was, God, teach us to hear your voice. I pray for our church family to grow in knowing and learning how to discern God's voice of him moving and guiding today and what he wants us to do and say now, where to live, where to move. Tons of my believing friends have left California, right? Because we deemed it good or not good. We deemed it Christian or not Christian or healthy or not healthy. But it's like, no, how about we go into those places and we bring about Christ to bear? That's what Jesus did, right? The, the, the religious leaders said to, to leprosy folks, no. He's, the widows and orphans, no. It's like, he, you know, I, I'm prestigious. I'm in this place. I'm different. I'm set apart. Don't spoil this, right? We see this in the scriptures. It's like, you know, depart from me. This is not good. But Jesus embraced it. He was called, a, you know, a friend of sinners, he went right into those places and says, no, this is where God's heart is. He wants to redeem this. And that's what we want to see in these different rhythms. How can God redeem people through these rhythms in life? So I want to dive into the scriptures. If you guys can open your Bibles, I want to read a lengthy passage for multiple reasons. One, for us to learn about what it says in Daniel chapter 4. Two, to introduce more of the story of God to us. And three, to see the rhythm of story form and listen come out in the scriptures. And this, because we can go into many different passages and pull out what story form looks like of, and what listening to God forwards and backwards looks like. But I want to dive into Daniel. Daniel, the book of Daniel. Is, I'm reading the book of Daniel in my quiet time. It stands out in, uh, to me. Uh, and uh, this, this part stood out to me. So if you guys have a Bible or want to use a hard copy, they have, we have hard copies all over. Um, but we're going to start in Daniel chapter 4, verses 4, but I want to set the stage a little bit. So uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel is about, uh, it's ultimately about God. Ultimately, it's about Jesus. I just want to be clear about that. When you read Daniel, don't finish a chapter without thinking about how Jesus in the midst, is in the midst of this, okay? So, but the book of Daniel is highlighting a character, an individual named Daniel, and he's got three friends that are highlighted here. They have Jewish names, Hebrew names, Jewish names, and they also have been given uh, Babylonian names because in this season of their life, you have Israel, the country, and they were just conquered by a country called Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, that's a fun one to say. Can you guys say Nebuchadnezzar? That's a fun one, right? So King Nebuchadnezzar came and he, you know, there's this conquering of Israel. And it was very common practice when you conquer a location, a country, that you take the prominent people out of there. So they're not like a, a strong powerhouse again. And, and so you like you weaken and you would even they would even introduce people from their culture to stay there. To make them, and that's what happened to Samaria, northern Israel, right? There was a mixture of two cultures with the Israelites, and they were called half-breeds because they left some, some of the culture there, some of the individuals that were not Jewish there, and it mixed the crowds. Men and women were connecting together, mixing the different cultures. So here, Daniel and his friends, they, Mishael and Esariah, they have Hebrew names or Israelite names, and then they were given names more common that we know, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Those, those are the names we recognize if you know any of the stories from Daniel. Uh, do you guys remember Daniel's Babylonian name? Yeah, Bel it's like Belteshazzar, right? There's like a couple Zs in there, and you hear it pronounced a little differently. So that's his Babylonian name, okay? And so Daniel has had like favor from God to have like words of knowledge. In the scriptures, there's a spiritual gift called words of knowledge or given the gifts of knowledge, receiving information and knowledge about something that you shouldn't know about, but it's given to you by God. 
And Daniel has had favor from God. And you see Daniel just rise up in this book to have favor among the king. And so there's this relationship that's being developed. The king's having dreams, and he's calling upon all these wise people in his eyes to help him with these dreams, and they're not having any solution or understanding to it. And then Daniel comes. It's like, oh, this is what it means because he's given words of knowledge from God. And so this has already been happening. Here's another dream, another situation that King Nebuchadnezzar is faced with. And if I could say this word on a Sunday, it's freaking him out, this dream, okay? So if you're a child here, I want you guys to listen to this dream. If you're an adult here, I want you to listen to this dream. Pretty cool dream. I had a dream last night, actually, about a couple here in our congregation named Micah and his wife, Diana. It was a really cool dream last night. So we have dreams, and God speaks in dreams. Well, this person, King Nebuchadnezzar, is not a follower of God. He didn't grow up in a home that feared God. He's living apart from God. He just didn't know about God. And here we see God speak in a dream to someone who's not a follower of him. How gracious is God, right? So verse 4, let's start from verse 4, chapter 4. Verse 4, chapter 4, and we go through the dream, and then Daniel breaks up the dream on the next page. So it says here in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity. So he's living, and it's all about him. It's about his comfort, his prosperity, his life, doing what he wants when he wants, and this is the life he's living. But one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. Anybody ever have a bad dream? Right? I've had a bad dream. Right? I, uh, so I'll get into that later. Okay. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me and told, I told him the dream. His name, Belteshazzar, uh, after my God and the spirit of the holy God in, is in him. It's kind of what his name means. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. So he's already built this reputation with him. Now tell me what my dream means. When I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. <laughs> the tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. I'm pausing right there. You guys remember another tall structure that reached the heavens? Tower of Babel. This is us trying to learn God's story. In Genesis chapter 11, we had this tower. Was the tower for bringing God glory? No, to bring glory to man. And we see this here, right? All right. Where was I? You guys know? Verse 12. Thank you. This tree, it had fresh leaves, green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. This is the, the, the dream. Then... As I lay there dreaming, I saw a messenger, a holy one, coming down from heaven. So this is also in his dream. The messenger shouted this. The next several verses, this is what the messenger said. Cut down the tree and lop off its branches. Shake off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Chase the wild animals from its shade and the birds from its branches but leave the stump and the roots in the ground bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounded by tender grass. Now 
Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. And this messenger continues from heaven. It says, and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the field for seven periods of time. Let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. For this has been decreed by the messengers. It is commanded by the Holy One so that everyone may know that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world. He gives them to anyone he chooses and even the lowliest of people. Belteshazzar, that was the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can do so. But you can tell me because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So he, he gives credit to Daniel. He knows Daniel prays to God, his God. He knows that they've already had these experiences, right? So here's Daniel. This is what Daniel says. Upon hearing this, Daniel, also known as Belteshazzar, was overcome for a time, frightened by the meaning of the dream. So he must have stopped and was like, oh, no, 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 something like that. Right. And so the king is watching Daniel and, and, and he says, uh, uh, then, then the king said to him, Belteshazzar, don't be alarmed by the dream and what it means. Belteshazzar replied, I wish the events foreshadowed in this dream would happen to your enemies. And then he refers to him as my Lord, a respectful term to a king. It's a lowercase l, my Lord, and not to you. The tree you saw was growing very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves and was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade and birds nested in its branches. That tree, your majesty, is you. For you have grown strong and great. Your greatness reaches up to the heavens or up to heaven and your rule to the ends of the earth. Babylonian, the Babylonians were known as a, a really strong country and powerhouse at the time. Verse 23, then you saw a messenger, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it. But but leave the stump and the roots in the ground bound with a band of iron and bronze and surrounding by uh, tender grass. Let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with the animals of the field for seven periods of time. This is what the dream means, your majesty, and what the most high has declared will happen to you, my lord uh, and king. Uh, you will be driven from human society and you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn. This is key until you learn that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. And gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. And then, and then uh, it's a beautiful section of the passage where Daniel says, King Nebuchadnezzar, Please accept my advice. Stop sinning. <laughs> Stop sinning and do what is right. Where have you heard that before? Something along those lines. You'll be accepted if you surely do what's right among Cain and Abel. He said, he, he finishes the thought here. He says, uh, 
Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. The next section talks about how this dream came to fulfillment, right? And then it ends with, it ends with this. After, in verse 34, after this time has passed, so it, it took place and the king was out into the wilderness and his hair grew long and his nails grew out. It's definitely not the life he was used to living, right? When you become a king, you don't just randomly become a king. You grew up in a home that was prestigious. You, you grew up being taken care of. And so here he experienced exactly what the, the prophetic dream was saying and so verse 34, after this time has passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to where? I looked up to heaven. My sanity returned, and I prayed. So looking up to heaven is this phrase of, I repented. I, I, I turned, and I said, I have nothing. I'm looking to you, most holy one. God, I'm, I'm looking to you. And as soon as he had this heart posture of change, he looks up, my sanity returned just in an instant. And I praised and worshiped the most high and honored the one who lives forever. He starts praising God and it goes into what he praised God. He rule, his rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. What a humbling thing to proclaim after being in this kingdom that was as high as the heavens. He does as he pleases among the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him to say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? Like, why are you doing this? You have no right to do this. When the sanity returned to me, so did my honor and, and glory and, and kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. What a testimony. In this experience, we, we, we receive King Nebuchadnezzar living this lesser storyline, this, this storyline of, 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 of this great kingdom and status. And then we see that Daniel, who's, who's, who knows his story, who's asking questions, who's in relationship with this king, shares about the greater story in, in and through his dream. And we see him uh, proclaim, you know, this message of turn from your sin, turn to God. When you humble yourself, you'll be restored. And King Nebuchadnezzar at the end, he's, he knows it's, I, I have more honor today, but it's not about this. It's about worshiping God. It's about proclaiming him. I guarantee the kingdom he leads from that point on will, looks very different from the kingdom that he lived beforehand. And so Daniel, in here we see the storyline of Daniel listening to God, and receiving this knowledge of, of being able to discern this message that was given. And so in and through this, as I close, I want to encourage us that we are not exempt from being King Nebuchadnezzar's. More common than not, we are going to be Nebuchadnezzar's. That, that's in the cards of our sinful nature. We're not exempt from living a lesser life story. We're not exempt from listening to things apart from God to lead us in ways away from God. You know, it's not uncommon for us to, to leave this experience on Sunday morning and not have any interaction with God or about God, around talking about God, nothing. That, that's a very common thing among believers, unfortunately. There's tons of room for us to respond like King Nebuchadnezzar did, where we repent. God, forgive us for living a lesser story. 
Forgive us for listening to the voices that are not yours. Forgive us for living for our own glory, for our own ways where we're not living a life of authenticity, graciousness, or selflessness. Forgive us in that. The encouraging piece is that Daniel's a somewhat of a foreshadow of Jesus. But we see Jesus being a better Daniel in, in that, that Daniel was exiled in this place. Jesus was also exiled into a place called Earth, away from his home. And we see that Jesus not only delivered the true message of the gospel, but he was the message. And Daniel, or Jesus being the better Daniel, in that not only did, did, did Daniel proclaim, here's a way back to God, but Jesus laid down his life and said, through my blood shed, through my body broken for you, is a way back to God. I will sacrifice all. And what's greater with Jesus is that when we are living the lesser story, when we're not listening, when we're, not, when, when we're living a life centered on ourselves, and this could happen any given day, where all the purposes of life that are supposed to be about God are about us, Jesus lived perfectly on our behalf. For he always lived with a greater story in mind. He always listened to the voice of God forward and backwards. And so when we fall short of that, we're forgiven. And so if we practice the same heart posture like we shared a couple weeks ago, when you take the bread today, you thank God, you thank Jesus for filling where you fall short of being that perfect son and daughter, always living the greater storyline, always listening and setting aside God in, in the midst of all the rhythms of your life. Jesus did that. We fall short in that. We could thank God through the bread that he's done that. We could also thank Jesus for the good news of his death because when we are living selfish lives, when we are living the greatest King Nebuchadnezzar way, right? Jesus forgives us through his bloodshed. We're forgiven. So I want to encourage us, whether you want to pr practice participating in practicing the gospel with one another or on your own with God, take the elements today. Be reminded, just like God has given the Passover to the, the Jewish culture, he's given us this meal to remember him, the life and death of Christ, and how he's good news. And by God's grace, may we grow in understanding how to live out the story form rhythm in our lives listening to people and their stories and listening to the greater narrative and learning the greater narrative. And same thing with the rhythm of listening, listening to God forward and backward and paying attention to who we are listening to in our lives. Amen. I want to pray for you guys and then uh, we'll continue our day. Father, we give you thanks for your words. Give you thanks for the book of Daniel. Thank you for just the, the fullness that's even greater than just chapter 4 of the message that you have through Daniel. We give you thanks uh, for you, Jesus, and how you lived uh, and, and why you died. And I pray for us that we can grow in our understanding and knowledge and belief in the grand narrative story and, and, and paying attention to, to listening to you and you alone, listening to you backwards and forwards and and being intentional when we listen to other people's stories, Lord. I pray that you redeem those areas of our lives. We ask those things in Jesus' name. Amen.